Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to give the floor to European Capital Partners. Uh, Leon and Alan will uh, provide a co-presentation for you in the next hour. So, enjoy. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, thanks uh, for attending after the coffee and coming back. Um, I will, of course, also speak about value investing, but first I, let me present uh, Ellen and, and myself. Um, so my name is, uh, well, I'll start with Ellen, of course. Uh, Ellen is my co-fund manager. Uh, we work uh, together at European Capital Partners, which is a fund management boutique uh, here in Luxembourg. Uh, Ellen has been, uh, in, pre in a previous uh, stage of his career, he has been my trader uh, for the Nordea European Value Fund, where I was one of the managers. Uh, myself, I started my career, oh, it's already now uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, at uh, a Luxembourgish bank. I'm, I'm a Luxembourger. Uh, and then in 2002, I joined Nordea to become one of the managers of the Nordea European Value Fund, which I uh, managed between uh, 2002 and 2014. Um, uh, then I joined the boutique and uh, in one of the previous uh, ECP, in one of the previous um, uh, speeches, there was a lot of discussions on skin in the game and alignment of interest. Well, um, at uh, one of the reasons we represent ECP here is that uh, we try to have, as a company, a lot of alignment of interest. Um, uh, I'm personally uh, owning uh, half of the business. We are all invested in our uh, strategies. Uh, we uh, come and actually um, uh, the second shareholder comes is a real entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial outfit uh, uh, coming from the private equity world, also with a, a very long-term uh, mindset. Um, but we are not uh, talking too much about uh, ECP, uh, but more uh, about what we are actually doing. And, uh, well, it's still the same slide, unfortunately, than last year. I'm not uh, innovating uh, a lot there in, in terms of investment philosophy. It has been now the same uh, since 2002, uh, when I started uh, at Nordea. Uh, but uh, at ECP, what we are trying actually to do is to apply the same investment philosophy, but go back to the roots. And um, uh, here, our uh, investment philosophy is simply based on three important pillars. And I think a lot of the elements, a lot, when I listen to the presentations during the day, a lot of the elements are recurring and are uh, coming back in different forms, also in, 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 uh, in, the investment, in our investment philosophy of ECP. There must be a common denominator to value investors in some way. Uh, so, uh, the first pillar is entrepreneurial. For us, uh, and uh, me, it's simply the definition of risk which is here important. Because an entrepreneur, when he wants to, to uh, invest in a business, he probably doesn't look at the historical volatility of the stock price, he doesn't look at the beta. What he looks at is the fundamentals of the business. And over this more than 15 years, and I'm now applying this philosophy, uh, each time an investment went well or went very wrong, some also went unfortunately wrong, um, uh, it was due to the fundamentals. It was either a development in the fundamentals which we didn't get or understand, fully understand, um, uh, or it was something unexpected happening uh, and we didn't adjust on time uh, in, in our model. Um, the second part, the second pillar is value. We are value investors. Well, uh, I'm not trying here to preach uh, the, the, the converted already, uh, but uh, what, what is for us value investing? I think value investing simply means that when we look at the business in our modeling, we run the business for cash. So we look at how much earning power can this business generate. We have nothing against growth. Growth for business is very important. However, we find that it's very difficult to estimate that growth correctly. So we prefer to look at, at earning power, and earning power for us is defined as, well, there's a long definition, it's a capacity of a business to generate discretionary free cash flow. So it's actually uh, operating cash flow in a non-growing company in a normal year minus the maintenance capex. 
And then we are value investors because, of course, we look at the margin of safety. And for us, that concept is very important. We didn't invent it here in Luxembourg, you know that. Um, uh, but when Benjamin Graham initially used it, uh, he um, uh, introduced this concept. The safety is a very important uh, word there, because why do we need a margin of safety? It's, it's a safety against our own wrong assumptions, our own wrong understanding of the fundamentals of the business. So if we can, and we are looking for a margin of safety of 40%, if we can find a business that is trading at a significant discount, as is 40%, even if we are slightly wrong in one of the estimates, it means that we still buy at a low valuation. That's the whole aim. But of course, we are not in, uh, the Red Cross. We are basically the aim is uh, to uh, generate performance. So the second aim of the margin of safety is to generate return. So the idea is, and that leads me to the third pillar, investing. If you invest um, uh, with 60 cents for the euro and you wait long enough for Mr. Market, as we value investors call it, to recognize the underlying value of the business, this margin of safety will close, and that's our source of return. Typically, we hold to four to five years. Um, uh, we are, as investing for us means, every investment needs to make a difference. We run concentrated portfolio. Currently, we have in our European portfolio, which is our main franchise, we have 37 uh, names. Um, but investing also means uh, go where not reproducing the index. There was a lot of discussion on the merits or, or of course, uh, a, a lot of uh, passive investment bashing. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think, however, that um, uh, we have the freedom and we need to have the freedom as active investors to go out of um, uh, the, the normal path and find our investment opportunities where the un undervalued earning power is. So we are not sector constrained, not market cap constrained, and, and we uh, just look for the little jewel, the, the 37 names out of a universe of more than 1,500 companies uh, in Europe. Low portfolio turnover, four to five years, concentrated portfolio means portfolio turnover around 20%. So, and, and here again, if we look at, at, at um, uh, what value investing is, and I, I, I think this is for me one of these, um, was one of the aha moments when I, I read from uh, Professor Greenwald uh, the book on uh, value investing, uh, which you certainly all have read. Um, uh, there is this picture on decomposing the intrinsic uh, value of a business. And I think all value investors will probably lie in the, the two bottom uh, lines uh, of, uh, of this graph because uh, they are not trying to put a value on growth. But I think in, va in the value camp there are two different families. There's one family who looks more at the as Benjamin Graham did, at the net net situation, at the intrinsic value, um, at the, the uh, asset value, uh, the liquidation value of a business. And uh, this way of investing is uh, typically in today's world, it would be investing in low priced book. That's not what we are trying to do. Um, uh, why? Because we think it's not enough to have a low price to book. I think Italian banks are at a very attractive price to book. However, you may consider they, they are a value trap. Um, uh, however, uh, uh, when we look at this, we look at the liquidation. Uh, we don't really look at the liquidation value. Why? Because we think there's a risk that uh, the valuation may even get cheaper. Because if a company destroys cash year after year, um, a low price to book, may stay a low, low price to book and it has destroyed shareholder value. So what we look for is earning power, the cash flow. And now, um, and uh, well, uh, I, it's not a surprise that uh, this year we have a, a lot of slides, uh, slides defending value investing. Of course, value investing uh, has, has, been, has had a pretty terrible journey um, uh, and uh, when preparing for the conference, I, I was just thinking, let's put it a little bit in, a in the longest historical perspective I could find. 
And usually, uh, well, first, then it's the US market, and second, uh, it's, uh, it's actually Ebert's son at one uh, stage gets involved. That's uh, normal. Um, uh, so here you have a graph on, on the one side of, of the interest rates, and you have the relative performance uh, in, uh, uh, in large cap uh, US growth stocks against value stocks. And you typically see that, well, you see since the 30s, there was a relationship between the way interest rates go and the way uh, value goes. Value underperforms if the interest rates are going uh, down. Okay, we heard it on numerous occasions uh, before in different ways. You have all understood the reasoning behind. But for me, one simple explanation is simply that a growth stock is a very long duration stock. It's long duration because the cash flows, you only see them in a, if you see them in a very, very long, uh, long time. And if you discount at a lower interest rate of discount rate, you obviously, uh, uh, growth looks better relative to value. This is now uh, changing. Um, should change, has not changed yet, I should precise. <coughs> Uh, why? Because, well, uh, we all know uh, quantitative easing. I think this is now back to Europe. It's simply as M uh, MSCI Europe against MSCI growth. You see there were two big periods. So one is before 2008 and then after 2008. What happened in 2008? No need to uh, discuss it again. But quantitative easing, low interest rates, made growth simply very attractive for the investors. And... Um, uh, and this explains also why uh, value investors uh, need to put on many slides on why they think now they still have a case and the legitimacy to uh, be at the conference. Um, here I borrowed, and, and this is just to give another angle uh, to, to, to the whole discussion. I think it's, um, now we ha start to have a trigger. We have a trigger which is rising interest rates. But the second thing is we have a valuation gap between if you look, and this comes from Société Générale, from Andrew Lapton, um, uh, if you look at the, the discount of value in terms of here, it, it's a forward PE, but you can take every other measure, mm -hmm. between uh, growth and value, this discount value is as cheap as it ever was. Uh, it, it never was in, in the past. And um, uh, actually, the interesting thing is, it's historically, it's in the moment where this gap was the biggest that, of course, the returns you would get as a, if you invest in value are the biggest, the so forward, uh, the expected returns. And here it's a division by quintiles. Um, you, you will get the presentation also online, and we can uh, discuss it in more detail. But it's, we have a, a trigger, B, we have a, a good... Uh, moment and a historically high discount. So how are we uh, dealing with this? Um, uh, I think, well, we will now uh, apply it to uh, precise investment cases. We use, as um, most bottom-up stock pickers, we use a screening model for our uh, idea generation. Uh, we do a due diligence on our companies. We have an eight steps due diligence process. We will now apply to two uh, different stock stories. And then we build our portfolios. Uh, we will now lead you through um, uh, two, uh, well, actually two and a half big, uh, names. Uh, so uh, uh, I hand over to, uh, to Alan for the first one. Uh, so on the menu today, uh, we have first Kronos. And I find it so interesting that we present uh, Kronos on the day they uh, actually come out uh, with a profit warning. Uh, I think this morning we had already uh, a gentleman who presented Atos and made the case on Atos. Um, uh, well, it appears, well, the slides were already ready probably uh, late last week. And this is actually makes now maybe it interesting to confront our long-term view to what the company actually uh, uh, is saying. And then uh, the second one will be Cloetta, uh, which is uh, chocolate and, and sweets. And then uh, the last one is Jopka, which I presented last year as a case. It's just a case refresher. And now, Alan. Great. Thank you very much. So um, we now
now going to take you through uh, how this idea came to us. What were the thoughts uh, that went through our minds as we did our due diligence? All of the due diligence is made with the purpose of trying to place ourselves in the middle of that company and try to understand what is the situation of this company between competitors, between clients, between suppliers. How does the whole environment tick? A little bit on our screening. We do a screening based on quality and we do a screening based on value. So each company will get one score for each that are mutually independent from each other. That means we can build the entire universe into, uh, into a chart like this where you have the quality score on the horizontal line and you have the value score on the uh, vertical line. <clears throat> and here I took this data as of the 11th uh, of October. In the industrial machinery sector, in which Cornus is, we have 61 companies with liquidity above half a million euros per day. That's sort of our universe. And uh, that ranges uh, companies between market cap of 100 million and 26 billion. So a very large divergence of the sizes of companies. Each dot you will find there represents one company. And the middle of the the middle of the chart here, right in the middle, that is the market. Everything is based on a score from minus two to plus two, standard deviations away from the market. As you see, industrial goods companies is a little bit cheaper than the market. On average, they have the same quality. Machinery is a little bit better quality. Industrial machinery is even a little bit better. That's the three blue stars. And Cornus is one that looks to be, on a quantitative basis, looks to be of uh, both better quality and slightly better valuation. So meaning a lower valuation than the sector. Um, so we thought, let's, let's look into this company and see what that is. Cornus, in the big scheme of things, it's a uh, German engineering company that produces all the equipment for beverage and food companies that makes the food and beverage companies work. So think of uh, whenever one of you went to the office uh, or here today or you go home and you drink a bottle of water, out of, probably out of a plastic bottle, chances are that one out of four of you is an indirect client of Cornus. So they make the entire uh, the entire factory work for the food and beverage companies. From filling lines, they blow air into a bottle, they fill it, they put it on a pallet, they wrap it, and they have interlogistics into the warehouse. So that's what they do. So this, this uh, equipment they produce is mission critical for their clients. It's a rather small company, market cap 2.7. That's a little lower today. Not much. Uh, Four billion in revenues and an EBDA margin of 9%. Company has a net cash position. And it's a staff heavy company. Staff heavy in the sense they have 15,000 uh, employees. And most of them expensive German engineers. And that, that's an important point in the, in the uh, company and in why the company is a little bit less profitable now than what it will be. And um, the business is one where you install the equipment on the client side, and then you make a little money on that, a tiny margin, and then you make more money on servicing that equipment afterwards. Because the worst that can happen for the clients is for the food and beverage companies is that they have downtime in the production. It's extremely expensive to have downtime in a volume-driven business. So, the installed base will grow for each item you sell, and each uh, production line lasts eight to 10 years for which you are servicing the business. So it's very important with a high market share. High market share for them means that even though it's a small company, they own 24% of the global market. So it's quite an important player. The main drivers of the business is the, uh, the, the classical case we've heard um, a million times from the emerging markets. So it's a growing population overall, particularly in Asia, and a bigger part of that growing population moves into the cities, so urbanization. For some reason, when people move into cities, they start to drink more water out of a plastic bottle. Very simple, very understandable business. That's what we like to have. 
<clears throat> then another thing happens is that the, the concept of a bottle, the shape of the bottle, you can look at the tables, you already, there, you already see three different shapes of types of bottles. And if you look across the supermarkets, you look at the milk, you look at the yogurts, you look at the juice, you look at the water, you look at whatever. There are hardly two identical bottles. All of this more customization of the bottles, if you will, requires more equipment. Great, so here we are in the Dodilians. This is a terribly busy slide, but uh, that is, uh, this is the machine room of ECP, basically. We have eight steps in our, in our due diligence process. We look at ESG, proxy, financial statements, how the industry ticks, where is the company in the value chain, what is the cyclicality of their product uh, life cycle, how is the current operating environment, and uh, what makes the management tick, and what type of management do we have. So let's take them step by step. ESG, it's a quick one. It's a top ranked. They have never been involved in any ESG issues. We, at ECP, we don't use ECP as a uh, value tool. We use it as a risk overlay. So if companies are in a half a week ESG performance score, so we have a no-go sector that, uh, that two week companies on ESGs we do not buy. If they have a yellow, it's a traffic light system, if they have a yellow one, we evaluate, is this something that in the end can, uh, can bash on the earnings or not? Uh, most of all, we use it as a risk tool. Here, there are no remarks, top ranked, green on, uh, on all fronts. Proxy as the investigation, we look at, um, as we are in the end going to calculate a cash flow that is going to be the driver for our valuation. What we look for is, is there anything in the proxies that can steal that cash flow away from us? Examples could be, uh, heavily influential shareholders that have a short-term mindset, heavily influential shareholders that have a different mindset than what we have. Could be uh, two big debt holders that can take a claim on the cash flows of the company in case they fall into trouble. Because at the end of the day, we are always minority shareholders. Yeah. That's the difference between Mr. Bollore and uh, ourselves. Uh, we need to, to have this step in our proxy investigation. If you are a majority shareholder, you may call the shots. And if, if there's no, not an absolute alignment of interest with the minority shareholders, it can hurt us. Um, we saw in the past that uh, there were many funds launched uh, with family-owned businesses, etc. This can be a fantastic idea. But I also experienced over the last years that sometimes uh, having a major family owner can also be a hurdle uh, for a shareholder value creation for the minority shareholders. Absolutely. In this case, we found that the founding family, the Kronzitter family of Germany, they founded the company in 51. They still own uh, more than 50% of the company. And they are generating wealth and they are distributing that wealth to the shareholders. They are not afraid to do tough decisions in terms of restructuring when, when they need to and they are also not afraid of investing in M&A. So they are good stewards of our capital. So in this case we have a dominating shareholder but we are not afraid actually. We are happy to invest alongside them. Financial statements, what we look for there is uh, typically um, two major points. Do companies have a lot of recurring, non-recurring earnings? So a lot of management has, uh, has uh, bonus schemes that are fixed on EBIT earnings and they push a lot of cost below the EBIT line. That happens over and over and over again. And um, we, of course, need to clarify whether these costs are really non-recurring or if they happen to recur every time. And some, for some companies, it's a bigger issue. For others, it's not. In this case, uh, they have uh, very seldomly one-off. So it's a, they have a 100% cash conversion of their, of their EBIT earnings. It's a good sign of quality. Important drivers of the financial statements is to understand the cost structure. This is a rather low margin. And the biggest driver of their cost is salary cost and steel 
as you can imagine, when they built these, uh, these plants. The salary cost is an important step because part of their now cost savings plan is to shift some of the uh, expensive German engineers more on site, so globalizing their footprint, meaning that you are hiring the engineers locally where your clients are, means that you can service the client better. That is a, a huge competitive advantage in this business. We also look for what is the cyclicality of the business? What happens when we have a, a bad year in the business? And this, this company never lost money. So in the last 20 years, always positive on the earnings uh, and particularly positive on the cash generation. The company is one with very low capex needs, but rather high working capital needs. So that's sort of the, the, the framework. We have no warning signs on, uh, on, uh, on this topic. The industry structure is, you can imagine, there are not too many players in the industry when, the, when a company with four billion in sales have 40 24% market share. So there are three players only. Kronos, a company called uh, KHS, that's a subsidiary owned by Salzgitter and uh, a French company called Cidel. Um, these are the three only players, and Kronos is two times bigger than the second one, and it is the only company that is profitable. That's a very important topic, being profitable, because if you are the food and beverage company, and you want to buy your equipment, install it in your factory that it should last for eight to 10 years, and you want that guy to service your business. You want to also to make sure that the guy who gets the equipment order, that he's also around for eight to 10 years to service. Because as a food and beverage company, the only thing you have in mind is no downtime, no downtime in the production. So you need to have somebody with staying power. And Kronos clearly ticked that box. Um, due to the small size of Kronos, in relation to huge clients, so the biggest, two biggest clients of, uh, of Kronos is uh, Coca-Cola and AB InBev. Obviously, uh, the big ones have, uh, is, experience, is experiencing industry consolidation, and that led last year to a sort of a dry, dry uh, a moment where there were not too many orders in the market. And the two privately owned players, they had management changes who were fighting heavily for market share. Um, that put a downward pressure on their prices. Now uh, one of the two competitors is without the management uh, again. <clears throat> Inside the value chain, we try to position saying, where is the, what is the reason to exist for this company? Why do their clients place the orders with corners? They place them, as I said, because it is mission critical for them to function. Service network is a huge asset to have. It's also expensive to run, but if you don't have it, you don't get any orders. So service network, that means that you establish offices and engineers locally on site, and you need to have some inventory of spare parts because you need to be able to move fast. That's why the, this business is one of low capital requirements on the capex, but rather high capital requirements on the working capital. Working capital is is not a huge issue for us in this case because the product that is in the inventory, if you think about it, these are products that are supposed to be used for maintenance of a machine the last 10 years. These products that is held in the warehouse, these, they don't lose value. They just stay there. It's like uh, putting a pencil in the warehouse. If you use it today or tomorrow or the next year, it still writes the same. So it's not, uh, there's not a risk of obsolete uh, values on the warehouse. <clears throat> pricing power is an important issue. They lost the pricing power in 2016-17 uh, in because uh, some of these competitors who had both new managers, they went uh, really aggressive on getting market share. And now they have found out that they don't make any money from that, so they have pulled back. In May of this year, Corners announced towards their clients that they uh, increase across the board prices by 4.5%. So that means that the margins in their order book is currently on the uptrend. It's partly to increase the margin, but also to mitigate the offset, to offset the costs on, the, on the higher cost, higher salary costs for the engineers. <clears throat> this is this pricing power is something that is quite important for what's going to happen in the next couple of years. I find 
product life cycle, this one is quite easy. There is not a lot of cyclicality. It's a 4%, 4 to 5% growth market with uh, stable, stable end market growth. What may be lumpy from time to time is that this, this is an order driven business. And when you have huge consolidations between the, on the client side, that uh, often puts a delay on the, on the placing of the orders. So, but that, that in the essence, it means that you push a little bit of the demand from one half year to into the next half year because these machines continue to run on the client side. Continue. <clears throat> Operating environment right now is uh, challenging because you have uh, steel cost going up, you have uh, salary costs going up for your engineers, and these two items are the primary drivers of the total cost base of this company. Um, for that, to meet that, they announced these 4.5% price increases I mentioned uh, um, before. And, uh, and they, at the same time, they are lowering the number of engineers in Germany, and they are expanding uh, primarily in the, in the Asian market or in uh, Central European countries. Management, as I said, this is a family-driven company. The son, Volker Kronseder, is now the chairman of the board. Uh, as, uh, as the founder, he, uh, he stepped away. They had a new CFO in 2016, Michael Anderson. He comes from Gear Heatwaves, where he, uh, and before that he was with, with uh, Carlsberg, and before that he was with Arthur Anderson. So he has a very long uh, experience in transforming consumer-driven companies into the, uh, all in relation to the food and beverage. This guy is a, is a, key, a key person uh, in this company. So what do we make out of all of this? Our conclusion is that Kronos is a sound company. They have a strong balance sheet. They have a technology leadership, and they have a market share leadership. Management is good. The company is not going to go away uh, anywhere. Uh, anytime soon, and the company is not easy to replace uh, for their clients. Once you have bought the equipment, you stick with the equipment, you stick with your service partner. So the risk to our cash flows is not severe. There is not a lot of cyclicality around this. The cyclicality may be rather big, I must say, on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis, because you can imagine for a company that has 28% of sales in working capital, it does not move the need, or it, it, it moves the cash flows a lot from one quarter to another if the working capital goes up or down. <clears throat> the company has now a plan in place where they say we will go from 7% earnings before tax margin to 8%. This morning they said that they did, uh, in 2018 we will not meet the, uh, the 7%, we'll be at 6.5%. That does not really disturb our case, and it, it is also not fully unexpected because they only made the price incre increases in May, and over the summer not, not a lot of stuff is happening, uh, but the wages are still ticking in every month. So this is not the biggest surprise. The bigger driver of this, uh, and it is, I would say, almost pre-programmed or with high certainty that this will happen, that they will go from 7% margin to 8%. Before they said that we can do this over two years, we never believed in that. So in our valuation model, we put in that it takes four years to go there for the reason that the main driver is, the, is that you need to work with people, all the engineers. So you need, that takes time. So they said we will do it in two years. Uh, we say we don't trust that. We think for conservative reasons, we put it in over four years. The working capital ratio, they will reduce from 28% till 22%, that's a huge cash flow driver for this business. And the, the, the drivers for this change are also very credible in my mind. It's a very basic stuff like uh, finishing your, your production sites three days earlier, having a quicker billing process in your business, that's one thing they have been terribly bad at. They have simply been slow in billing their clients and slow in following up. These are low hanging fruits. So from the step from 28% till 22, 
on my estimate, two thirds to three quarters of that is purely driven by self-help measures. So I'm, I feel comfortable by saying this, well, this is a company that can generate substantial growth in their cash flows, or even if they don't grow the top line. Our valuation is based on 3.8 billion of sales. I think they will do 3.9 billion this year. They did an, an acquisition that I did not yet factor in. Um, so it means that the entire, basically the entire operating earnings growth from seven to eight percent can be done without any additional working capital assumption. On today's share price, that means that, that uh, that's 20% of current market cap. In the waiting time, you get paid uh, a dividend of uh, two and a half, three percent on a net cash balance sheet. For us, this is a case of a machinery, a capital good company, where the price earnings multiples have in the last six months collapsed by 25 percent. The earnings estimates have remained virtually stable. So it's a company that has food and beverage as the end market driver of the business, but it is traded more as a machinery company supplying into the automotive sector. Over time, these, that, these fundamentals will kick in, and right now it's trading at between 9 and 10% free cash flow yield. That's it. Okay, um, uh, just one, one point to add. Now we discussed the eight steps, but that's only part of the whole investment case because we build, of course, models on our companies um, where we are running these businesses for cash and we value the business for cash um, for this uh, earning power. So if you have here a uh, free cash flow yield above 9%, that doesn't mean it's just to represent it. If I, we would come here and tell you about margin of safety of 40%, then we would have a discussion of how you come to the earning power value, etc. But I think this part of the modeling, if somebody is interested, we can, of course, extend it and, and show you how we come to our uh, fair values.